it's time for some more you comment we respond yeah Whip! the first video is jake cody continues to confound the poker guys he sure did if you want to see that video click right up here quick recap dermot blaine i think was his name opened with pocket sixes cody called with ace queen on the button max silver who was the chip leader of the world series of poker europe with two tables left i believe is where they were right Something like that two or three tables left called with queen tennis page out of the small blind sean buchanan called the big blind flop came out jack eight four giving nobody anything mm. cody bet 85k after everybody checked which was a very small bet about the, a third of the pot silver raised to 205k i think 210 something like that something like that it was a very small check raise with just an overcard and a gut shot and a backdoor flush draw cody somehow called with ace queen high yeah that was weird the turn was a seven bringing nine ten as the nuts and completing a lot of the gut shots like five six is now a straight and a lot of the other gut shots now have a pair of sevens silver bet again he bet like 300k into a pot of more than 300k i don't remember <laughs> something nice like that jake cody called yeah he called somehow with ace queen high the river was a queen so we avoided some fireworks there and i went check check and cody somehow won it was weird it's incredible yeah here's what y'all had to say andrew lipkin says i noticed two little clues first listen to what norman chad says at two minutes in if silver had been playing almost every hand like chad implies cody has a decent reason to give silver a wider than normal check raising range second if the editing for this hand is true the turn card came out at around eight minutes and silver started assembling his bet 10 seconds later the turn card was absolutely not a blank for either player's range at this point, and Silver only gave it seven seconds of thought. Seven seconds is plenty of time for a decision like c-betting or not c-betting a flop. But in a confrontation between two big stacks, after both players displayed tons of flop strength, it seems suspicious. If Silver had value on the flop but could now be beat by a straight, he'd have some proper thinking to do. I like this. Yeah, let's start with the second one. Okay. All right, that is a cool thought. Now, yeah. that... It the thing you initially said is a good question. Yeah, is the editing. editing accurate? Because that's a big deal. If it is accurate, then yes, you have a very good point here. You would think he would take some more time before putting in the chips, and that would be a tell, you would think. It would seem like, oh, I have to bet because I'm bluffing. I'm right. just continuing. Right. So I think it's a great point. Yeah. And it's really, really on point. Yeah. And Jake was watching him very closely, as we pointed out. He was watching yeah. Silver's hand as the chips go in. I'm sure Jake notices the time differences yeah. as well. So if indeed that editing was real time, mm -hmm. then it's a great We're thing. not sure about that though. Eh, how could we be? Uh, onto the first point, which was if his range is wider for check raising uh, yeah. because Silver's been bullying the table. That that's a good point as well, something we brought up. That would definitely make Cody's play better than if Silver only had gut shots and he can't have all the gut shots, can he, with, when he's check raising? I mean, no, probably not. Yeah, so if, if Silver has stuff like King Queen in his range and a bunch of other random air just because he's that guy who does that right now, that makes Cody's play make a lot more sense to us. If he's been doing that, but yeah. we don't really know. And just because he's playing a lot more hands doesn't mean he's check-raising a lot of hands. Maybe he just has the nuts every time. Yeah. All right. Psychologist says, great hand. It's a pretty nondescript name. It's cool. Yeah. <laughs> I was so hoping that Cody would value bet the river and get called. Not sure value betting would be a good play, but it would look amazing <laughs> in this instance. That's true. Yeah. Would Silver ever try to go for a check-raise with the nuts on the river? I think it's possible, but then again, Cody seems to think Silver has Queen-9 suited and Queen-10 suited here a lot of the time. What do you guys think? Uh, I don't know if Silver would go for a check raise with the nuts. Probably not. He'd probably just bet it because he got called twice anyway. Yeah, you'd think that would be a rare occurrence for him to go for a check raise with the nuts. I think Jake Cody checking back the river is perfectly sensible. I mean, Silver has a lot of, like we, we said Jack-8 suited was one of the big hands that we were discussing whether or not Silver would bet the turn with. If he did, that river is pretty bad for that card, yeah. but he's not going to fold if Cody bets. So it might be a good check because Silver's definitely calling with his two pair hands like that, but he might not bet them. Somehow Jake Cody just always knows where he is. Against uh, Robert Mizraki in the previous Jake Cody confuses the poker guy's hand, he moves in on the river with just one pair and no kicker, top pair and no kicker, but still in a spot where we thought it was really hard to get called, but it worked out great. He got called and got the full double up. Here, he checks back top, top in a spot where I think it's a good check back for sure. He's wrong though. He could have maybe gotten called. Maybe, <laughs> yeah. maybe, but maybe Silver just gives up anyway. Yeah. Maybe Silver's like, it's not good enough. Silver's right. hoping it goes check, check, and Jake has a jack, right? Right, like absolutely, jack. yeah. And uh, that's not how it worked out. Next up, we have what the what? Disaster at the WSOP main event final table. Click right up there and check it out. It's a blind versus blind hand where we have JC Tran opening the small blind with ace queen against Jay Farber with seven left in the World Series of Poker main event. Holy moly, what a spot. What a spot. <laughs> so JC makes it 1.4 million, I believe. Yeah. 
And Jay Farber with two sixes decides to raise it up to uh, 3.2 million. JC has ace queen, by the way. Yes, he does. Yeah. As I actually had already oh, you mentioned. Did you? Okay. But it's cool. Thanks, just in case. You never know. Yeah. Uh, JC Tran thinks that's not good enough for me <laughs> and makes it 6.5 million. Jay Farber says, uh uh uh, clicks it back essentially to 10.5 million. JC only has 21 million total. JC somehow finds a fold, which we thought was the bad. strangest of all decisions. We thought it was bad. Yep. So let's hear what the other people thought about it. And the other okay. people, I mean, y'all. So, y'all. Cow de Souza Guedes says, okay. The four bit size is pretty standard for his stack size. He can't go bigger because he would not possibly have a bluffing range if he commits himself to the pot. The other option would be to four bet jam this hand, which would be the standard play. It's not like Villain can call Jack 10 suited versus a four bet because of the sizing. You have to consider the equity he has against the four bet range, which if pretty poor, I think it's supposed to be is pretty poor, plus the ICM situation and reverse implied odds. I have to disagree with this. All right, go ahead. So I like your thinking. I agree. The standard play would just be to move in here. I certainly agree with that. And we're talking about JC. It gets confusing. JC, JC trans four bet to 6.5 million. Correct. Yeah. Right. Um, I think if he's going to play the hand, it's okay to four bet this, but you can't fold here, I don't think, if you're going to four bet it. And JC, Jay Farber, excuse me, absolutely can call. Like, you're talking about how he's doing with his equity. He's in position. There are no real ICM implications for Jay Farber. He's got 70 million chips. Yeah. JC Train only has 21 million. Jay Farber is supposed to call with Jack 10 suited and try and bust JC right now. Now, he might flop top pair, not get away from it, and double up JC, but that's okay. He, right. can, he can afford to do that. And he also can decide not to double him up. That's up to him, right? By the way, he wouldn't be doubling him up. If he I, I also want to question one other thing in this. And I think this is an intelligent, well thought out oh, comment. Yeah, I want too. to clarify that. I think it's a good comment and it's really good. That's twice I said good. Well, say it 30 times. Okay, it's good. But I don't know if it's true that JC can't have a bluffing range if he makes it a bit bigger. It is a tournament situation with huge ICM implications for JC. So if he made it something like 7.5, where he's more likely to fold out some of Farber's range there, he could still fold to a shove with yes. a bluffing range because of the ICM implications. We don't have to do the direct chip EV in this spot. That is a great point. JC could absolutely have ace four off, make it eight and a half million saying, go away, go away, go away, I have a blocker. Farber moves in and he's like, I'm not going to get it in with 30% here for my life when I think I'm the best player at the table. Right. I don't ha it doesn't matter what the price is. There's seven left at the World Series. Every spot laddering up is a lot of money, and first place is changes my life in, in crazy ways. To be clear, I don't think that would be a good play. No. I don't think you should be doing that. If you're the best player at the table, you shouldn't be taking these huge pre-flop risks, which is why JC probably shouldn't have four-bet in the first place at all. Agreed. All right, moving on. Vishrant Goyal says, I disagree with you guys on this one. Oh. That's cool. We like disagreements. No. Okay. I like disagreements. Grant, Grant doesn't like <laughs> I only want praise. Okay. Yeah. There's a lot of table dynamics here. That includes Jay Farber being the tightest player at the table. Fair point. I've seen the whole of the 2013 main event, and this is literally the first bluff Jay Farber has made, or noticeable bluff at least. I don't know what that means, noticeable bluff. That he noticed. Oh, okay. Maybe. Because <laughs> weren't they all getting the cards like yeah. 30 minutes later and stuff like that back then as well? Yeah. So like, if he was bluffing at all, like everyone does get to find out. You see how Antonio in his commentary says, J. Farber does not look super strong to me when JC had four bet. Antonio's really good at that. And as soon as he did five bet, he says, if I'm JC Tran, I don't like if I'm holding jacks or even queens. I don't say how he can fold queens, but if someone can, it's him. This is because every time J. Farber has shown himself strong, he has aces or kings. When I was watching this, I, th I myself thought that J. Farber here has nothing less than ace king. In fact, ace king was the bottom of his range. And really, if JC Tran was holding jacks, he surely would have folded in that spot. Hmm, maybe he would have. I, I mean, he, he I folded ace queen. It's not that different. It's different though. It's a little different. I, I mean, I hear what you're saying and I think the way you just thought that out is exactly how JC Tran was thinking that right. out. Right. Right. And that's why you don't want to put yourself in that spot. I mean, JC is making this small four bet to try to get information it seems. And that's a mistake because Jay Farber gave him the wrong information. He gave him misinformation, which is what you're supposed to do in poker. Yeah. And Jay Farber did it correctly. You're also saying Ace King is the bottom of his five betting range, but he five bet with sixes. And while sixes is technically ahead of Ace King, no one would consider sixes to be anywhere near the hemisphere of Ace King in terms of value hands, right? Right. Like Ace King is a top, top, top hand. Sixes really isn't. Jay Farber, we don't know if he's calling or not when he five bets. If JC were indeed to shove, we know if, if he had Ace King, he would be calling. Right. Yeah, yeah. I mean, overall, it's just a really weirdly played hand by J.C. Tran and by Jay Farber, and it's hard to figure out what's what and what's going on. I think all of you had really good comments in this one, actually, and you had a lot of good thoughts. I just feel like it's 
pretty simple in the end. JC shouldn't be four betting if he's going to play it this way. I mean, he really might have been four betting to get it in, and then the click back threw yeah. him off, and he's like, oh, well, Farber only clicks it back with these super strong hands like, like we're hearing right here, so I should actually fold. That wouldn't be the worst, I guess, but I, we certainly think just don't put yourself in this spot. You don't have to. You're JC Tramp. The very last hand of this you comment we respond but is... But not, not all you comment we respond. Depending on how the future goes, who knows? The robots might take over between this one and the next it one. It is true. And if that's the case, it's been fun, guys. Yeah, it's been a good one. Anyway, it was... <laughs> Could you trick the best online player ever? We were, of course, referring to Chris Mormon, who had, at least at some point in recent memory, the best online CV of any tournament player ever, multi-table yeah. tournament player. You can see that by clicking right up here. Quick recap, Chris Mormon opened under the gun with 8-4 offsuit for some reason. I'm going to give him credit because <laughs> he's really, really, really good, yeah. although I wouldn't recommend that play. Don't do it. He gets called only by Moritz Kranich in the big blind with king-queen of diamonds. The flop was 8-7-3 with one diamond. It went check, bet, call. Kranich kind of heroing with king high there. Turn was the jack of diamonds, bringing a flush draw for Kranich, who decided to lead at the pot. He bet, I don't remember the amount, but he did certainly bet. Yeah. Chris Mormon did not believe him, and he called. The river was a 10, so now it was a four straight on the board. The diamonds did not come in. Any nine makes a straight. Kranich bets again. Mormon pretty quickly calls, wins yeah. the hand with a four. It's a cool hand. So uh, you guys had some interesting thoughts about this, actually. Fun Diver 198, I think kind of encapsulates a lot of the sort okay, of things great. on the on the YouTube comments here. He says, so the donk playing 8-4 from under the gun got sticky with a crappy pair and beat the donk who donked the turn with a flush draw and made a bad bluff on the river. Nothing is this scream to me. I don't know. If, well, oh, nothing screams this to me, I think is what he's trying to say. We are watching a high-level hand. Looks a lot like a $1 MTT on Poker Stars. Okay, well, okay. as I said, it was... Not necessarily a thing that we would do. Definitely not a thing we would do to no. open 8-4 offsuit under the gun. All of the post-flop play by Mormon, we might do if we had a similar read and we figured out the situation the way he can. Absolutely. Here's the thing. He really is the best online player ever as far as multi-table tournaments are concerned, or at least until very recently he was. I don't know if somebody's overtaken him. I mean, the point is this. This guy thinks at a super high level, and while you may see ultimately you know this in a one dollar mtt also the reasons for it happening in a one dollar mtt and chris mormon doing it are going to be completely different chris mormons are going to be well thought out and ultimately be profitable the one dollar mtt not so much although it is fair criticism to say to us you can't just take a player who everybody knows is good and right. say it's okay because that guy's good yeah right but to be clear it makes some difference and it should that person has earned our respect through years and years and years of being very very good at poker and like I said, while we wouldn't make the 8-4 open under the gun, all of the rest of Mormon's decisions were really good in the hand. And to be clear, so part of it is we know Chris Mormon thinks about these things. So rather than saying, well, that's just terrible, like we might in some other hand. Like if Gus Hansen did it, maybe? <laughs> maybe. Yeah. But um, with Mormon, we know it isn't just terrible. We know there's more to it than that. So we seek to understand a bit more, right? It doesn't mean to say we don't kill players who are really good. We absolutely crit criticized Dan Coleman for opening Jack-9 off in the World Series with like not very many people left, right? Under the gun yeah. with 25 blinds. We thought that was crazy. And we don't think that we couldn't come up with a reason why we actually tried in our podcast. We couldn't come up with a good reason why yeah. that, but it could be. So then we killed him for it. But we just think Mormon's sitting there thinking, I'm so much better than everyone else. And he had a lot of chips. He had the chip lead at the tables. Yeah. It's a little different than when you have 25 blinds. When I open under the gun, they're going to put me on a particular kind of range. I'm miles from that. I still wouldn't open 8-4 myself. Don't get me wrong. It doesn't, honestly, it doesn't really seem defensible. It seems like a bad play. Right. But. That said, that guy's amazing. So, you know, he found a way. We decided to, like, not, not get tripped up in that yeah. part of it, I guess, because we know it's Chris Mormon. Right. So maybe maybe you're a little bit right. Yeah. Too. Okay. Seth Barr says, I don't think Kranich ever donk bets with a hand like a set or two pair on the turn against this opponent. If his opponent is really running over the table like you say he was, hmm. wouldn't his objective be to make a hand and then let his opponent hang himself on turn and river? Why? When we finally make a hand, would we want to risk losing the loosest and most aggressive player at the table from this hand? The donk bet seems pretty transparent for what it is. A bet designed to get Mormon to fold. Fair point. Those are definitely fair points. If yeah. we if we think Mormon's going to three barrel a lot, then that's a good point. The problem is we think Mormon probably has a lot of checkbacks in his range on the turn, even though he's aggressive, because he doesn't necessarily have to have a bluff. He just has to have a worse hand that's going to check back than the made hands. So if we had nine tennis Kranich, we would want to make sure to get value from some of Mormon's checkbacks, like maybe his hand that he actually has, stuff like that, which he's going to call the bet with. So there is that, but I do understand the heart of your point. Yeah, it is a fair point, and the question would be exactly this. Like, is Chris Mormon really just going to double barrel a lot or not? 
I would guess he actually has a lot of checkbacks both on flop and turns, to be honest. And this board, I would expect him usually to check back with his exact hand as well, as it turns out, because it ends up being a medium strength hand yeah. by, the, by the time we get there. Right. right. Um, but ultimately, it's, it's hard to rep a good hand when you donk the turn. It's yeah. just hard no matter what. And so sometimes you actually have it, but it's hard to have it because this is exactly what people want to do, right? They want to check and either check raise or check and let the person hang themselves. Playing out of flow in general just makes things weird and changes ranges in a way that is strange. And you have to have a holistic strategy for it or else you're just going to be too unbalanced to one side. Usually people are bluffing and are weak in these yeah. spots when they donk uh, on the flop or on the turn.